Global finance is fragmented and the ways of the world are shifting. But we all know this, when we build together, we thrive together. This is Converge, a new podcast from Convera, where financial incumbents and iconoclasts come together to inspire, where disagreement breeds discovery, where anticipation overcomes trepidation and curiosity reigns supreme. Come with us as we shape the future of finance. Welcome to Converge. So, embedded finance. Embedded finance is on a tear. McKinsey estimates the US market for embedded finance reached 20 billion in revenue in 2020. And while we all know that that was a year of abnormal internet activity, there's no sense that things have slowed down at all. Oracle is even predicting that the market could be worth seven trillion in the next 10 years. As it's one of the hot topics here at Money 2020, we decided to assemble a panel to look at what's happening in the embedded space, where it's headed, and what innovative business models hold the most promise. But first off, what is embedded finance? Well, it allows companies to offer financial products and services such as lending, payment processing, or insurance to their customers without the need to redirect to traditional financial institutions therefore retaining complete control over that customer experience and, in most cases, offering a superior customer experience. Think Apple Pay, Google Pay, then a traditional provider such as a bank. So back to where is this space headed? We've got an amazing panel together today. First off, we've got Lisa from Banked. Lisa, could you share a little bit about your background and Banked? Thanks, first of all, Alex, for having us here today. My pleasure. So I work for a company called Banked. We're a real-time global account-to-account payments provider. So I guess we are an embedded payments program. So the company's been around for around four years. Mm-hmm. Our mission is to enable real-time payments globally mm. for merchants and for consumers. So think about having a pay-by-bank button in a website or a QR code that's on a bill and you scan that QR code and through your biometric auth into your banking app, you approve a payment instantly. So that's what we're doing, we're building out. I run the European business for banked. Prior to that, 10 years at PayPal, I spent a long time in payments Mm -hmm. and in banking before that, doing credit cards and product development. So have a lot of experience in this space and great to be here with the panel today. Yeah, great to have you, thanks. And we're also joined by Miroslava Betanova from Griffin. Miroslava, could you intro yourself a little bit and Griffin as well? Uh, thanks very much, Alex. And thanks, Convira, for inviting me to by this means, uh, podcast. Miroslava, head of fintech at Griffin. We're still quite a new player on the UK market, recently been granted a UK banking license with restriction, currently in the mobilization period. And the main objective of what we're trying to do and achieve in the UK market is to be a API first banking partner for licensed and non-licensed institutions that wish to embed banking and financial services into their overall Mm -hmm. offering. And this includes everything from safeguarding of funds, operational accounts, and customers on board. So we also developed our own onboarding platform. And it's just really, really exciting time because we think that embedded finance is really rocking Mm. the world of of fintech right now, taking it by storm. And um, we believe we can genuinely add value to those who wish to enroll their financial services to a wider consumer audience. Great to hear. Thank you. And last but not least, we have the one and only David Birch. (laughs) Could you please uh, tell us who you are and a little bit about your background for those who don't know? Uh, I'm an author, advisor and commentator on digital financial services, and I have a a number of board and advisory positions um, in the space. So I I spent many years working as a consultant. I lived in Europe, North America, Far East, working mainly in um, financial services, payments, that kind of thing. And now I focus on those kind of high level advisory services. Great to hear. Thank you for joining us. So could we go a little bit into- And I wrote a couple of books, did I mention that? (laughs) I'm sure some of us have read those books. Lisa, could you just give us your your take on embedded finance overall at a high level? Yeah, so uh, I might say something controversial here, but Please do. embedded finance really is just a buzzword for an integrated experience. And so embedded finance has been around for quite some time. I mean, a PayPal checkout button is an embedded yeah. payments product and mm-hmm. that's been around for you know months, decades nearly. Right. For me, it's just about creating a seamless experience that mm-hmm. doesn't require handoffs somewhere else and means that the end customer that's using the product 
is getting the best service and it is most highly converting. So for me, it's the the way that we should be thinking about building out digital services for customers these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how about you, Miroslava? What's your take on it? I very much support Lisa's view and probably I would add embedding finance is a way of enabling customers to make transactions in a secure way. So kind of adds a layer of security and trust mm-hmm. in the way that they transact and who they transacting with. I think the main objective is integration. So the end user has a very seamless kind of relationship, most to say, with the way they transact and with the companies they transact with. And at no point they feel, oh, okay, is my is my money safe? So that's really for us the main objective and, and a take on embedded finance. Mm-hmm. How about you, David? Well, you know, I mean, finance is quite a big word. There's quite mm-hmm. a spectrum there. So. So when you say embedded, fi- like in my head, you're saying embedded finance, but like you said at the give, there's really there's embedded payments, there's embedded say, embedded insurance. But there's all sorts of these things that are embedded, mm-hmm. and it's true to say the payment stuff has been around for a while. But mm-hmm. um, but this kind of marriage of open banking and APIs and you know the additional sort of security technologies, I, I, th- I think does provide something novel, and I think it's it's no surprise that some of the projections are so great because of the point that Lisa made about not interrupting the customer journey. You know, for most customers, most of the time, I, don't know, okay, I wouldn't say this necessarily in front of one of my banking clients, but I'm not sure customers really care that much about banks, mm-hmm. whether it's Griffin or anyone. Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm, I don't know, I'm mucking around with Lego and, and I get some kind of insurance or savings account or card or whatever, mm-hmm. that to me it's the Lego savings account. I don't really care that it's Griffin Bank or Starlin or whatever in there. Back yeah. end, so yeah. so it's it's tied up a lot to do with brand and image and yeah. and all this kind of thing. But in terms of, sort of the overall curve, I'd have to say you have to think about where it's going mm-hmm. because right now the users of those embedded finance services, broadly speaking, are people. Yeah. But in the not too distant future, it won't. It will be bots, mm. and people won't really be in that loop at all. Sure. You know, so so I think the reasons why those projections are so great is not because not because of what's happening right now, although that is on an upward curve, it's good. It's like when you start to think about it downstream, you start to think about the kinds of financial services, the number of transactions, the fact that a lot of those transactions will be between things, not between people. Yeah. And then you've got AI and bots coming into it. You see this massive multiplication in the number and complexity of transactions. Mm-hmm. But actually, people may not have a lot to do with it. Yeah, sure. And, and it's quite interesting, David, that you said people don't really think about, you know, oh, I care about that this money is at Griffin Bank, where we're starting, etc. And I think that's almost kind of the beauty of banking as a service and embedded financial services. People do it very intuitively without really creating any relationship with the end mm-hmm. banking I, institution I, whereby previously you probably would know who is kind of behind the transaction, mm-hmm. who you just trusted with your money. And and for me, that is one of like the really great things about truly embedded financial service. Pe- people don't think about the money in the same way when it's in the process or in transit. Oh, I, I, we don't want them to think about it. It's boring. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but uh, I think you know, one touching on one point you're making there about how people say like how do people think like most people don't like we think about you know what's an insured account and what's not mm-hmm. an insured account and what's what's credit and what's not credit what you know these technicalities of whether it, and I, I'm not sure that most people know or care about any of those kind of things so. Like as an industry, we have to make that robust infrastructure for them so they don't have to think about it. And add security. I think that's the thing. I think that's probably where the only brand benefit comes in. So it might be an old, boring bank, but I think I can trust it because it's been around for 100 years. Yeah. Whereas some of the newer services might have a lower level of trust. So, so part of the process here is to make people understand and aware of the security and the robustness of the systems and how that ecosystem works and that knowing that you've got that level of safety and security. But yeah. When I'm yeah. on the Manchester City website and I click the button that says, would you like a Manchester City savings account or whatever, 
99.9% of people are never going to read to the bottom of that email and see that it's actually Griffin providing it because it's that's not the brand they're interacting with. I mean, that's, that's why Embedded Finance looks so good because people are interacting with the brands that they know and trust and want to work with. And we can take the rest of that away from them. They don't have to worry about those other things. You know? Absolutely, yeah. So David, I did a little bit of research on some of the commentary you've left in this space out there uh, in the world of media. And in 2021, there was a Forbes piece where you said you might go so far as to predict that the COVID-19 virus shock may well mean a quantum leap in strategy in the world of digital identity. And what if it's not finance or government, as most of us had assumed, but travel and hospitality that drives digital identity into the mass market? Have you seen this play out? Yeah, I did. I did kind of one because certainly, you know, in the UK, we have an incredible fraud problem. Fraud is absolutely out of control in the UK. Mm. And we've made no progress whatsoever on any kind of digital identity. Mm -hmm. We, You know, I don't have some bank identity that I can go and log into things with. I don't have a government identity I can use to go and log into things with. For, for, for most of the most important financial transactions in my life, I have to fall back on the gold standard of British identity, which is the... British Gas Quarterly Bill, you know, it's like, <laughs> which is a bit disappointing, really, when you think about it. Mm. So I was thinking, like, well, who is it that could actually make a change with that? And then when I realised everybody was happy to, to carry around their COVID passports, mm. I thought, well, perhaps that might be another vector for getting something done about it in the market. Like, if you've got to have it for your British Airways app or, you know, whatever, then maybe you'll get used to carrying it around. Yeah. As it happens... People were happy carrying around those COVID passes, but we never used it as a platform to, to go further. So mm -hmm. I, think we did, I think we did genuinely miss a little bit of an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there's also been a lot of buzz in this space in recent years around buy now, pay later. Something of more of a backlash, I'd say, recently against it. I mean, I listen regularly to the Pivot podcast where Scott Galloway just goes crazy ranting against BNPL and how it is tending younger consumers towards getting into debt to relieve their need for instant gratification. And I have to say, I, I somewhat share that concern, but I'm curious, it's still a thriving space from what I've seen. And, and do you think that negative blowback has potentially damaged the perception of embedded finance as it pertains to or relates to BNPL, even if most consumers aren't familiar with the term embedded finance you know, at all? What do you think this BNPL effect has been, if anything, on the space as a whole? Well, it's, it's, it's validated the business model. I mean, yeah. really, I mean, the fact that someone like Klarna can do so well, you know, tells you yeah. that the business model works. The merchants like it, the customers like it, yeah. Klarna likes it. That, I think that's a separate subject from, if you like, the sort of regulatory gap. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't doubt that there needs to be more regulation in that space and we have to take action to stop people from but that, that's separate from the business model, if you see what I mean. I think, mm -hmm. I think from my perspective, the business model is brilliant at getting customers to try buy now, pay later yeah. and use it. So open access, giving the availability, accessibility, different types of checkout and in person as well. I think the thing that they're falling behind on at the moment is helping customers understand it and manage how they pay. Yeah. So through open banking, banks had to open up their data. So you can extract all your banking data into someone else's app and you can see payment schedules and how you're spending. The buy now, pay later providers haven't had to do that. Mm -hmm. So you're spending and you might have five or six pay in three installments that you've got to pay back or something else that's being paid in 28 days. There's, there's no way of pulling all of that information together and accessing that in one place as a customer to understand when your payments are due. Have you got enough money for the end of the month? Do you need to be thinking about rescheduling some of your payments? So I think at the moment, it's not quite the right open playing field that yeah. it should be to enable customers to manage it the best way that they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, thoughts? and I think in addition to the buy now, pay later, there's another really big rise of, of early access credits like product, which is early wage access. And again, mm. does it work as a business model? Yes, you know, is it safe from onboarding? Yes. But really, what is going to be impact of this type of product on the end users? And just like with BNPL, I think a more thought needs to go 
into a early protection of the customer from the consequences that you know this can cause if they have an access to such type of a product. Mm -hmm. you, you use Buy Now Pay Later, right? No. You never used it? Yeah, um, never I used have a credit card, card, but I never use Buy Now Pay Later. No, oh. I never have. Mm. I'm curious because I've never used it either. No, no, no. I'm, I'm a Buy Now Pay Later user and I use it because if I am buying clothes for my kids, they're not going to keep all of it. I'll end up having to send some of it back. So for me, it's not buy now, pay later. It's pay for what I keep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rent the runway sort of thing. Yeah. 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 David, I have used them. Think about it. Store card is actually a buy now, pay later product. And way back when, about 15 years ago, I remember I went into one of the high street shops and they said, oh, would you like to put this on a store card? And then you will get a bill that you're going to have to pay in 30 days time. Now, at the time, you know, you're 18, you kind of go, oh yeah, this t-shirt's great. And that's when I understood, oh, hang on, but if, if that t-shirt was 15 pounds, why am I paying 18 pounds yeah. 50 back? At mm -hmm. the time, did I recognize that as a buy now, pay later product? No, did I very quickly realize this is not the right way of shopping? And actually that was probably the last, for sure, the last time I've used this type of service. Now, I think, you know, I, I've not used it either, but you can see why it's attractive to merchants. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the low abandonment rates, uh, you know what I mean? Like it, it just simply completes more transactions when it boils down to it. So you should probably have invited some younger people and not me. <laughs> so, are we all really too old? <laughs> Even me? Oh, gosh. Well, speaking of the younger folks, if we look at Gen Z versus Gen X, there's a very different attitude to these kinds of services as we've been discussing. So will the next generation of consumers of financial products even have a relationship at all with a bank? Or will the bank just, just fade away into the background for them? What do you think? Well, it's not going to fade away. I mean, I think I'm right in saying you've got the newest banking license in the UK. Yes, that's correct, yeah. yes. So it's not going to fade away because there are going to be people like Griffin that yeah. can come and Change deliver. Form. But their business model, I mean, I'm not talking across your business model, but I mean, I'm guessing... Uh, that their business model is based more on operational efficiency than mm -hmm. a traditional bank. Because what they're going to do is they're going to deliver those services through an API at scale. Right. It's going to be a low margin, high volume business, mm -hmm. which I'm sure will be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, And that's very different from being a traditional full service bank. Yeah. And that point about the Gen Z consumers, I, I'm, I'm just not sure it matters. Like they're walking around with like an Apple credit card, mm -hmm. an Apple savings account, well, they, they don't care about Goldman Sachs and yeah. JP Morgan and whatever. So I don't know that it really matters that much. So it could be that some banks will have to make a choice between whether to move more in the sort of Griffin direction. Mm -hmm. Because traditionally those projects, I mean, we all sort of understand the basic breakdown of these things, right? So on the manufacturing side of financial services, you get a much lower return on equity. Mm -hmm. Distribution side has historically had a much higher return on equity, mm. but on the distribution side, you face much, much more rigorous competition. So if you can decide to opt for a more of a Griffin model, and you're sure you can get the operation efficiency, which you'll get by using new technology and not building on the old things, to me, that seems like an entirely viable way forward. I mean, do you have some Gen Z in the house at the moment? Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think... Do, do they care about Barclays and... I think, no, they don't. They definitely don't. I think what it all comes down to is your, is the user experience. So, yeah. you know, um, in my day, and I'm a Gen X, I had to go into a physical bank branch to open a bank account. I've got a sort code on my account that gives me a physical bank location. Like, I haven't been there since I was at uni. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of irrelevant. And, yeah. I, and I'm not looking for a physical relationship with a bank. I think what really is important is going to be whoever can provide the best full service digital yep. experience. So if I'm trying to make a payment over my daily banking limit, how do I go about changing that or getting approval to go above it? Please yep. don't tell me I've got to phone a telephone number. No. Please don't tell me I've got to go into a branch and do that. So how are you going to be able to use digital experiences and cover those edge cases where it's an over limit or there is a query on mm -hmm. a transaction that means that as a customer, I can have my complete relationship yep. with that banking service in a digital format without having to need to go into other channels. Because I can tell you now, like with my kids, like 
having to actually go and speak to somebody oh, or no. phone big... somebody up to, to I, I tell you, I'm, to I'm, not, I'm not Gen Z, but my heart sings. And I get some stupid thing from the bank. Oh, you've got to fill... Oh, you just call this number. Like when you see that, your heart sings. Forget it. Absolutely. You know, I'm not, Absolutely. no, I'm not going to call that. And then when you do call it, you get a recorded message saying, do you, do you know you can do this on the website? <laughs> well, obviously I can't because I was on the website when I got the message to call you. We, we tolerate that, but they won't tolerate it. Yeah, yeah, on the flip side, I would say that some of the more neobank type organizations or the, the, the new startup banks, I will find that sometimes I do want to reach someone via phone for some sort of support and they're not available. It's all via email or a chat bot or, you know, they get back to you later when I want well, that I, instantaneous touch I think, I think touch chat point. bots show you that way. For, I mean, whether it's embedded finance or not. I mean, yeah. to me, that's quite an attractive thing, which is if I do need to talk to somebody, first of all, I couldn't care less whether they're a real person or not. You know, in fact, if I, if I phone up the bank and find myself talking to Scarlett Johansson or something. I mean, that's great. <laughs> she can probably make more of a living out of licensing that to banks than, than you know, making movies. <laughs> so whether it's a real person or not, I don't care. I just want the thing done. Yeah, it's yeah. like, why couldn't I change this? It drives me mad with British Airways all the time. But, you know, why couldn't I change that ticket? Like, I don't understand. What's the, like, you have to phone. Why? Why do I have to phone up to change it? You know? Well, I just think sometimes the bots don't get it done, but perhaps with the next evolution of AI, the bots will get much more sophisticated in getting those things done. Um, Alex, and it's probably in the case when you've been a victim of a fraud, right? That's sort of the occasion when you yeah, exactly. then reach out for the interaction yeah. with an actual human being. And that's where I think there still needs to be that res responsibility and the protection of the end user from the providers of embedded finance and banking services. There could be different yeah. niches for that. I mean, because I can imagine a situation where you could be providing the same APIs to Saga, who deliver a completely different service to me, than Lego, you know, deliver to other people using those same APIs. So to me, that seems quite a plausible vision of the future. Let's quickly pivot over to the B2B payments side of things, just because we don't have much time, but I, I would love to just hear some thoughts on, you know, B2B payments, trust, is important, obviously, you have larger payments. Do you think there could be even more potential in this space for B2B or you know, different potential? What are the promising models you've seen it's out there? It's certainly the low hanging fruit mm -hmm. because to people like me, I am a small business as well as being a person. Yep. And it drives me up the what, you know, because you've got to go into the accounts and put your expenses in and all this sort of thing. And then, you know, oh, well, you've got to pay the inland revenue 12 pounds or so. Well, okay, just pay it. Why are you bothering me about this? Mm -hmm. Why have I got to go and log into the Inland Revenue and pay? Like, can't you just sort this out for me? We have things driving around on the moon. Surely you can pay the... So actually, I think in the SME space, that's kind of low-hanging fruit for this sort of thing. Yeah. And but of course, that also links with this identity thing as well, because we do at some point have to make some kind of stand against fraud. Mm -hmm. And the embedded services that you, when we said at the very beginning, you talk about embedded finance, there's embedded payments, embedded loans. Yeah. But actually one of the other things that banks do is KYC mm -hmm. and AML. And so this idea of embedded KYC AML, like if I go and sign up for something, you know, shouldn't they be able to find out whether I'm a real business or not from their bank? And, and that's exactly one of the one of the ways how Graphin built platforms. So we embed the KYC and KYB into our platform. Mm. So if our customers, be it that's a regulated EMI from UK, wants to become a customer of Graphin, we use our solution called Verify to onboard them, to mm -hmm. KYB on them. And let's say they then wish to run a challenger program for consumers in the UK market. Our embedded KYC solution already helps them to decide and helps us to decide what end users will be good and which ones are potential fraudsters. Nice. It, it's a win-win. You, you protect it this way the good users, segregate the bad users, and also you avoid situations where you have to tell your customer, oh, your fraud level reached a certain percentage, we have to offboard 20,000 customers, yeah. and you have to notify them within a week because yeah. that situation causes nothing but hassle. For them, it creates a brand damage, it creates a real hassle for us as a, a licensed institution. So I think embedding the KYC, KYB, the onboarding at the root of the financial service is really a way forward. Uh, th this point that, you know, embedded finance is more than just the money stuff. It's the other stuff as well. It's, it's the information, data management, risk management, all these kind of things. 
I think that's got a lot of legs. But as I say, I think if you look downstream, you see a lot more transactions and a lot of different kinds of uh, services for all of those transactions. There's a couple of other trends I've seen on the SMB side that I think will value from more thinking on how they're embedding the finance features. So the first one being embedded payments, particularly for invoice payments. A lot of small businesses will work on month in reconciliation, month in payments, having the ability to do real time payments and uh, real time reconciliation on those payments and even do things like split those invoice payments into a number of transactions to manage them with their cash flow, I think is really valuable. And I would say the other side is, is back to the point we talked about earlier on the buy now, pay later, the lending piece. So lending for small businesses and micro businesses, I think is really important. Not traditionally something that perhaps some of the banks have done so well, they tend to focus on the larger end. And having the ability to lend on future receivables for those businesses and give them short-term cash flow injections to help manage the business's short term, I think is another really valuable feature that could be embedded into their financial systems as well. Well, Lisa, we'll close things out there. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Great conversation, albeit short, but I feel like I got a lot of nuggets from all of you. So thank you. Yeah, it's fun talking to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. 